So on behalf of the authors of Google program, I'm really pleased to welcome William Bennett Turner to speak today with us about his book, Figures of Speech, First Amendment Heroes and Villains. And while reading his book, all right, it, this is a used copy. <laughs> uh, I kept this particular point in mind, a point that he makes early on, that it's easy to support free speech when you agree with what's being said, but a challenge to support another's right to express ideas one disagrees with or even loathes. I found myself holding off judgment till I heard his arguments for each case he put before us, the beneficiaries of the First Amendment. It was an excellent exercise in re remaining open-minded while all sides were being heard. Turner practiced law for 45 years and has argued three cases before the U.S. Supreme Court. He served as the legal affairs correspondent for KQED television in San Francisco, has appeared on Nightline, CBS, Morning News, PBS, NewsHour, and many other programs. For 25 years, he taught courses on the First Amendment at UC Berkeley. And now please join me in welcoming Bill Turner. Hi, everybody. I'm glad to see that some, there's some interest here in the First Amendment and in free speech and freedom of the press. Google's life depends on it. Uh, nobody should take these freedoms for granted. They're what make us a free people. And these freedoms are very fragile. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the book, and then I'd like to say a word about WikiLeaks and the First Amendment. Uh, first, let me introduce you to some of the characters in the book. And you can feel free to hiss the villains and cheer the heroes if you can figure out who they are. Citizens United is a nonprofit corporation, uh, conservative politically, that produced a video hatchet job on Hillary Clinton during the 2008 primaries, and last year won the most important First Amendment decision of the 21st century so far, a decision that you're probably familiar with, making freeing corporations to buy political ads supporting or opposing candidates. Quite different is Yetta Stromberg, who was a counselor at a summer camp in San Bernardino uh, for communist families. Uh, children from 6 to 16 attended the camp, and she got them up every morning and held a pledge of allegiance to the flag. It was a little red flag with a hammer and sickle on it. Uh, and she was convicted after the camp was raided and all of the adults were arrested. She was convicted of flying a red flag, quote, as a symbol of opposition to organized government. And in 1931, hers was the first case in American history in which the Supreme Court threw out a law on First Amendment grounds. Americans do have a right to oppose organized government. Uh, Danny Martin, the man on the left here in the jail clothes, was a heroin addict and an alcoholic and a very clumsy bank robber who got caught red-handed and was sentenced to 33 years in federal prison, where he discovered a rare talent for writing. And he wrote a long series of, um, became an uh, award-winning author of a series of vignettes of prison life for the San Francisco Chronicle until he wrote one that was critical of the prison warden and they lowered the boom. Danny said, quote, I committed bank robbery and they put me in prison and that was right. Then I committed journalism and they put me in the hall and that was wrong. Judge, <clears throat> judge Robert uh, Schnocky, crusty old Republican judge in San Francisco, federal judge, presided over a trial I did on whether California could hold executions in secret, and if not, whether the state could prohibit televising executions. The judge gave the government the benefit of the doubt which is always a mistake in a First Amendment case. 
Then there's Earl Caldwell, the New York Times reporter who covered the Black Panther Party. He was subpoenaed by a federal grand jury to, to disclose all of his confidential sources and notes. The Supreme Court ruled that he didn't have any First Amendment right to protect his sources. That's the only time in history that the court has addressed the issue. Uh, Richard Hongisto, which may be a familiar name to you, um, was first sheriff of San Francisco, and he was somewhat of a hero in advocating government transparency. But he then lurched into villain status uh, when, as chief of police of San Francisco, he ordered the cops to confiscate all copies of this issue of the San Francisco Bay Times. Clarence Brandenburg, the Ku Klux Klan leader whose case established the right to advocate bad ideas, like racial hatred, for example, uh, his case still limits the ability of the government to restrict terrorist speech. James Madison, the father of the First Amendment, and Madison with one of his friends uh, that was at the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia where you can hang out with all of the founding fathers. They're all in bronze, but it's still interesting to be with them. Uh, Larry Flint, he is no James Madison. Larry Flint is the world's leading pornographer whose case against the Rev Reverend Jerry Falwell leader of the moral majority, uh, resulted in strong First Amendment protection for political satire. After the argument in his case, Flint said, if the court will protect a scumbag like me, then it will protect all of you. And Clinton Fain, he pronounces his name Fain, a hero from the digital world, whose adventures with the First, Amend First Amendment seem relevant to Google. When I first met Clinton, uh, he felt betrayed. He thought he had been promised freedom of expression. Instead, he got the Communications Decency Act. He was born in South Africa, and Clinton grew up under apartheid. When he graduated from college, he wanted to be a journalist, but the South Africa of the time wasn't a very promising environment for young journalists, so he emigrated to the United States, studied up on the Constitution, studied for his citizenship exams and so on, learned all about the Constitution, and he was naturalized as a citizen in 1994. The First Amendment's free speech clause was what he cared most about. He wanted to speak on the Internet. But Congress then enacted the Communications Decency Act of 1996. As a result of this law, Fain would have had freer speech in then post-apartheid South Africa than he had in the United States because his online speech was subject to the act. The act, which we call the CDA, was the most sweeping restriction on the speech of ordinary citizens that Congress has ever attempted. It was more threatening to the average person than the infamous Sedition Act of 1798. It had two provisions, two main provisions. One made it a federal crime to communi communicate anything, quote, indecent online, knowing that the communication was to a minor, somebody 17 years of age or younger. The term indecent was not defined at all. The other provision made it a crime to, quote, display on the internet anything, quote, patently offensive if it was, quote, available to a minor, as virtually everything is, of course. Violation of either of these provisions was punishable by two years in prison. The ostensible purpose of the CDA was to shield children from exposure to indecent online material. Every politician, of course, wants to protect America's children from smut. <laughs> 
The CDA was an act of legislative villainy because any modestly intelligent congressperson had to know that this clumsily drafted CDA violated the First Amendment. But nobody was willing to say that. Passing the law meant dumping the responsibility for saying so on the courts. And the CDA was promptly challenged by the American Civil Liberties Union and other organizations. They went to the federal court, district court in Philadelphia, which immediately stopped the government from enforcing the law during the lawsuit. The court found then that the CDA would criminalize a vast range of speech that Americans, at least adults, have a right to engage in. For example, using any of satirist George Carlin's famous dirty words from his filthy words monologue, shit, piss, fuck, cunt, cocksucker, and so on, uh, would be a felony if you put it in an email to your 17-year-old little brother uh, or made it available on any website that a minor could access. Displaying great works of art like Tony Kushner's Pulitzer Prize winning play Angels in America, which has a lot of rough language and sex scenes and so on, would be a crime. Magazines like Wired that appeared both in print and online and used some of Carlin's words would be protected on the newsstand but subject to criminal prosecution as soon as the editor pressed the button to post an article online. At the time the CDA was enacted, Clinton Fain's day job as a self-taught computer whiz was constructing and maintaining websites. But he'd also begun publishing edgy, provocative material that attracted the government's attention. In a dispute with the Navy over his using a Navy recruiting poster, uh, Fain got legal help from Michael Trainer, who was a prominent San Francisco lawyer. At the time, Trainer and I were uh, representing Wired Magazine in various First Amendment related matters, and we were concerned about the CDA's impact. We met with Fain, who wanted to challenge the CDA in any way he could. So we helped him have his day in court. Our main attack was on a provision of the CDA that was different from the ones in the ACLU case. It was an update of the old federal obscene telephone call statute. As part of the CDA, Congress made it a crime, also punishable by two years in prison, to say online anything, quote, obscene, lewd, lascivious, filthy, or indecent with intent to annoy another person. Clinton himself was annoyed and wanted to annoy the politicians and the prudes who egged them on, so he launched a website called annoy.com, which he announced was its own CDA, created and designed to annoy. Annoy.com had several innovative features. One of them was called Heckle. It enabled site visitors to construct and send email messages anonymously to various public officials and public figures. It operated like the Mad Libs game uh, and invited visitors to criticize the recipients in the most vulgar and hilarious terms. Most of the messages predictably would annoy whoever received them. For example, one could compose a letter to then Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich. This was one of them on Heckel. It might say, Dear Speaker Gingrich, your contract with America is brilliant, a pile of shit. It will save, ruin America. It will benefit all Americans, only the rich. You are truly a genius, an asshole. <laughs> the problem with Annoy.com was that if the CDA was constitutional, Clinton Fain was subject to criminal prosecution for violating both the prohibition on post posting indecency and the online communication of, quote, indecent material with intent to annoy. So we mounted a two 
two-pronged attack. First, we filed a brief amicus curiae, friend of the court brief in the United States Supreme Court, in the ACLU suit. And there we attacked the constitutionality of the CDA itself. Second, we filed our own suit against Attorney General Janet Reno in federal court in San Francisco seeking to enjoin her from enforcing the intent to annoy law. Janet Reno was my law school classmate, and it's hard for me to believe that she could believe the arguments that her underlings made on her behalf to support the CDA. This is uh, one of um, Clinton Fain's creations of about Janet Reno. Our case was a lot stronger, actually, than the ACLU's because the law we were challenging had nothing to do with children. The government couldn't defend it on the ground that it was needed to protect children from indecency. It was a flat-out ban on speech that adults have every right to communicate. The fact that a communication is made with intent to annoy can't save the law. Speech doesn't lose First Amendment protection by offending its audience. The government delayed forever, it seemed, delayed responding to our suit as long as it could, arguing that the ACLU's case would likely affect the issues in our case and the ACLU case hadn't been decided yet. The government insisted, though, on its right to prosecute Fain for any violations of the Annoy Law that occurred while the case was delayed. The court in San Francisco agreed with the government to defer any ruling until Reno versus ACLU came down, leaving Fain at risk if he continued to operate Annoy.com. He continued. On June 26, 1997, the Supreme Court decided Reno versus ACLU. It was a wonderful decision, a landmark of First Amendment freedom and a charter of liberty for the Internet. You ought to keep a copy of it under your pillow. <laughs> the opinion was written by Justice John Paul Stevens, and it qualifies him for candidacy in the pantheon of First Amendment heroes. Reno versus ACLU was the court's first internet case. It was a new medium of communication for the court, and nobody could know how the court would apply First Amendment rules to it. In the past, when confronted with a new medium, the court had sometimes fumbled. For example, when movies were invented and became commercial, uh, the court in 1915 allowed cities to censor them at will reasoning that movies were just a business like any other and subject to local regula regulation, not protected by any speech or press guarantees. That ruling wasn't overruled until 1952. And the court also botched the job when it first encountered cable television. But Stevens got it right in the ACLU case. His opinion first laid out in detail how the Internet actually works. 77 years old at the time, he retired last year at 90, uh, but at the time of this decision he was 77 and he casually observed that, quote, navigating the web is relatively straightforward. And this was pre-Google. <laughs> Stevens then dealt with the government's argument that the Internet should be treated like broadcast subject to government regulation like the FCC's regulation of radio and broadcast television. Indeed, the government argued that what it called the indecency problem on the Internet is much more pronounced than it is on broadcast stations. This was because, they said, the Internet operates, quote, without the intervention of editors, network censors, or market disincentives. In other words, the government argued that because ordinary citizens could communicate with each other directly, not as the passive recipients of programming directed at them by broadcasters and commercial sponsors, the government has to step in to police indecent material. In my view, the perverse result of that would be that the more democratic the medium, free of commercial censors, the greater the government's right to regulate the medium. <laughs> 
But Stevens demolished the government's argument, pointing out that the broadcast that broadcast regulation relied on the unique characteristics of the broadcast medium, the scarcity of frequencies on the electromagnetic spectrum, the long history of government regulation in allocating frequencies and requiring that licensees act in the public interest, and the invasive nature of the medium. Stevens said, these factors are not present in cyberspace. Finding that the content of the in, on the Internet is as diverse as human thought, Stevens concluded that Internet speech is at least as free as speech in newspapers, in books, or on soapboxes. The court then found the law unconstitutional. It was vague, in the sense that no one could know exactly what was prohibited. Congressman Wiener's Wiener? Who knows? And it was overbroad in the sense that it swept within its criminal pro prohibition speech that the First Amendment protects, at least among adults. In trying to protect children from indecent material, Stevens said the government may not reduce the adult population to, quote, only what is fit for children. The level of internet discourse cannot be limited to that suitable for a sandbox. Since there are alternative ways to shield children from exposure to unwanted internet material, like parents installing filters, for example, the government failed to justify criminalizing the Internet speech of ordinary citizens. Finally, Justice Stevens made short shrift of the government's last-ditch, desperate Hail Mary argument that, wait a minute, we have another interest, not just the interest in protecting children, but we have an equally significant interest in, quote, fostering the growth of the Internet as a communications medium. The government argued that the easy availability of indecent material on the Internet was, quote, driving countless citizens away from the medium because of the risk of exposing themselves or their children to harmful material. Justice Stevens responded, the dramatic expansion of this new marketplace of ideas shows the government was just plain wrong. The growth of the Internet has been and continues to be phenomenal. More importantly, Justice Stevens said, as a First Amendment matter, we presume that government regulation of the content of speech is more likely to interfere with the free exchange of ideas than to encourage it. The interest in encouraging freedom of expression in a democratic society outweighs any theoretical but unproven benefit of censorship. The CDA was thus given a decent burial and the most democratic means of communication ever invented allowed to flourish. Well, in light of Reno versus ACLU, Clinton Fain's case on the Annoy provision looked like a slam dunk. The Supreme Court had proclaimed that indecent material, indecent online speech couldn't be made criminal. And in our case, the government couldn't even argue that they had a need to protect children. But instead of graciously conceding, that the Annoy provision was unconstitutional, Janet Reno's underlings came up with a shameless interpretation of the law that would rescue it. The government now claimed that the law didn't mean what it said. It did not, in fact, outlaw indecent communications at all. The government said the provision prohibiting, quote, obscene, lewd, lascivious, filthy, or indecent communications was limited to obscene communications. Therefore, the government said, since Clinton Fain wasn't in the business of putting obscene material online, the law didn't apply to him and his case should be dismissed. Let me remind you what obscenity is. Something is obscene if it falls within the three-part definition of obscenity established by the Supreme Court in a case called Miller versus California in 1973. 
in order to be obscene. That's a category of speech that has no First Amendment protection at all. In order to be obscene, it has to appeal predominantly to the prurient interest, the interest in sexual arousal. Secondly, it has to be, has to be patently offensive in its depiction of sexual or excretory acts. And third, it has to lack serious um, political, scientific, literary, or artistic value. It has to, all three things have to be true in order for the material to be obscene. It's a very small category of outlawed speech. The first two, I mean, none of this makes any sense, um, but the first two things, you know, that has to appeal to the prurient interest, it, it has to turn you on one professor has said. The second thing says it has to gross you out. It has to be patently offensive. It has to do both. It has to both turn you on and gross you out. It doesn't make any sense. Anyway, <laughs> that's what obscenity is. Obsen the government hardly prosecutes any obscenity cases anymore. They're hardcore you know, bestiality, rape scenes, violent videos and stuff. They barely trouble with obscene cases. And Clinton Fain clearly wasn't putting anything obscene online. Well, the government's new definition of the Annoy Law was ridiculous. Um, the obscenity already was prohibited in any medium of communication, so the government's interpretation would render the law meaningless. Alas, two of the three district judges on the court agreed with the government using Reno's interpretation as a convenient way to avoid declaring the whole law unconstitutional. Since Fain didn't challenge the prohibition of obscenity, the judges dismissed his case. But since the district court decision applied only here in Northern California and Fain's communications were available all over the country, he remained at risk of prosecution elsewhere where other courts might read the law to mean what it actually said. All internet users would be living under a cloud, an uncertain cloud of a law that on its face made indecent, annoying communications a felony. So we took the case on direct appeal to the Supreme Court. And on April 19, 1999, the court handed down what had to be the shortest First Amendment decision ever. Quote, the judgment is affirmed. No explanation. It was a terribly disappointing outcome and a waste of several years of litigation during which the government never suggested limiting the law to obscenity. There was a sliver of a silver lining. The Supreme Court's action had the effect of making the district court interpretation binding nationally. It was now the law of the land. So in practical terms, the litigation got Clinton Fain what he needed, the ability to communicate material that might be considered indecent and to annoy recipients without fear of criminal prosecution. What he didn't get but deserved was a ringing affirmation that the CDA annoy provision violated the First Amendment. After the demise of the CDA, the Congress attempted three other laws to attempting to restrict online sexual content. They've only tried to address sexual content on the Internet, the only kind of content that the Congress has ever attempted to regulate. One of the laws, uh, you may remember, was about virtual child pornography. But only one of the laws, not the one on child pornography, only one of the laws survived in the Supreme Court. Uh, it required public and school libraries to install software filters to screen out material that may be, quote, harmful to minors. No definition of what that meant. And in a case ominously uh, named United States of America versus the American Library Association, the Supreme Court upheld the law on the reasoning that Congress could put strings on the subsidies that it chooses to give. Government doesn't have to fund libraries, but if it does, it can put conditions on the funding. 
Um, at the argument in the case, uh, the government lawyer was asked by one of the justices, well, what if an adult in a public library wants to get access to some site and it's blocked? Uh, doesn't that deny him the full resources of the Internet? And the government lawyer said to the court, no, upon request of an adult user, a librarian will come running and unblock the site or disable the filter. And on the basis of that kind of wishful thinking, the court upheld uh, the library law. Whether software filters solve these kinds of First Amendment internet problems is kind of an interesting, uh, amusing diversion. In the library case, the government urged that filters are effective in protecting children from exposure to harmful material while it was the civil libertarians who argued that they filters overblock and underblock and the government has no business policing libraries anyway in the CDA case and other internet cases these roles were reversed the ACLU argued that filters were effective and a less restrictive means of protecting children than criminal prosecutions while the government argued that filters were ineffective and they needed the criminal sanction. This seemingly, seeming inconsistency was nicely resolved by Ann Beeson of the ACLU, who said the central issue is whose fingers on the mouse, the parents or the government. When a parent installs a filter that keeps a kid from seeing a bunch of sites that may or may not be pornography, that's parenting. When government forces all adults and minors to use filters, that's censorship. The broader issue in all of this is whether the courts ought to accept the government's assertion that it has a compelling interest in protecting minors from material that it considers uh, harmful. The government has not been required to prove that minors are in fact injured by hearing dirty words or seeing sexual images. If we uncritically assume that the government has a compelling interest in shielding children from speech it says is harmful, what's to prevent legislators from enacting, say, a Literature Decency Act, or a law banning profanity, or bad grammar, or Facebook? All of those may be harmful to children in somebody's eyes. Well, undaunted by his adventures with the legal system, our hero Clinton Fain continues now to rail against politicians and powerful corporations using both Annoy.com and art. He's become a renowned digital artist, and he's a direct beneficiary of Larry Flint's case against Jerry Falwell and its protection for offensive satire and vicious political cartooning. Working with a computer and a digital camera, Fain has created political cartoons, collages, and other images that offend their targets and many others. Here are a few. Um, an attack on using emaciated fashion models. Uh, this ad for a gallery show that Clinton did depicts former Mayor Rudy Giuliani sitting naked in a urine-filled glass, referencing Giuliani's denial of funding for the Brooklyn Museum when he was, made, when he was mayor. Art Forum, the magazine, refused to run the ad. Fain savagely attacked George, the George W. Bush administration at every opportunity, especially the invasion of Iraq and the Abu Ghraib torture. One of his images shows the president nailed to the cross crucifixion style with an erection popping out of his loincloth in the shape of a rocket under the banner, Who Would Jesus Torture? The printer for an art gallery show found that Fane's image was offensive and destroyed it. This sort of censorship, of course, does not violate the First Amendment because only the government can violate the First Amendment. The Constitution it binds only the government, not private entities, people, churches, corporations of any kind. Only the government can violate the Constitution. 
Nor does this kind of censorship dampen Fane's willingness to exercise the freedom of expression that brought him to this country. His imagery sometimes is sexual and includes anuses and erect penises and George Carlin-esque words describing them. He says his mother wishes I would do watercolors. A First Amendment true believer, he keeps on poking at hypocrisy and blasting the mainstream media for laziness and cowardice. Now let me say a word about WikiLeaks and the First Amendment. On the 40th anniversary of the publication of the Pentagon Papers, today, June the 13th, Julian Assange arrived on the scene just too late to make this book. Where is this book, anyway? You took my copy. Dog-eared copy. Yeah, Yeah, well, Julian Assange didn't show up in time. Uh, Is he a First Amendment hero or a villain? When he was interviewed on 60 Minutes recently, he wrapped himself in the First Amendment, and he said about WikiLeaks, quote, Our founding values are those of the American Revolution, those of Jefferson and Madison. Assange may not know that our Constitution was written in secret in that hot summer in Philadelphia in 1787, behind closed doors, guarded by sentries. There were no leaks. We like to think of ourselves as an open society with a transparent government, but in fact we have a long history of government secrecy and constitutional tolerance of that secrecy. Here's my two cents worth on WikiLeaks and the First Amendment. My thesis is this. WikiLeaks basically owes its existence to two weaknesses in First Amendment protection for speech in the press. Both of the weaknesses stem from bad Supreme Court decisions that I unfortunately had something to do with. The rulings were that there is no constitutional right of access by either press or public to government information or facilities. That's Houchins versus KQED, one of the stories in the book. The other was that reporters don't have any First Amendment right to protect their confidential sources against compelled disclosure. That's Earl Caldwell's case also in the book. If we had a constitutional right to know what our government's up to and reporters could honestly promise whistleblowers confidentiality, which WikiLeaks provides, who needs WikiLeaks? I hope you won't think this is just sour grapes because I was on the losing side of these cases. I'm not trying to say if they'd only listened to me, we wouldn't have WikiLeaks. It's not that at all. Uh, It's just a recognition that our First Amendment rights are not as strong as they ought to be. To the extent that WikiLeaks informs us citizens what the government is doing in in our name and does what the mainstream media can't do, guarantee confidentiality for whistleblowers, it partially repairs these flaws in First Amendment protection. Of course, the government always has plausible reasons for keeping secrets and restricting speech. And all of the cases in the book, the government argued that some competing value might be national security, protection of privacy, shield our children from harmful material, whatever, some competing value, an important competing value, uh, requires a justi- uh, justifies a restriction on speech. It's the collision of these competing values that makes First Amendment cases so hard and so interesting. As for WikiLeaks, the government is considering prosecution of Assange for violating the Espionage Act. You remember that Daniel Ellsberg was prosecuted when he leaked the Pentagon Papers to the New York Times exactly 40 years ago. If Assange is prosecuted, it will be another epic First Amendment battle. No publisher has ever been prosecuted for violating the Espionage Act. 
Well, however the First Amendment issues play out, let's hope our own government's hands are clean. The Ellsberg prosecution was dismissed in mid-trial when the judge discovered that President Nixon's plumber's unit, trying to stop leaks, had burglarized Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office in an attempt to dig up dirt on Ellsberg. We have no evidence that the Obama White House was complicit in developing the sexual misconduct charges against Assange after WikiLeaks' three big disclosures last year. It may be just a coincidence that following immediately upon the disclosures, our friend Sweden issued an extraordinary international arrest warrant seeking Assange's extradition on a charge of failing to use a promised condom. There can't have been many instances of using that kind of heavy legal artillery for such a charge. Companies that supported the WikiLeaks site, like PayPal and Amazon and Visa and MasterCard, may have decided independently, without any government prompting, to withdraw their support. And hacker attacks on WikiLeaks servers may have been orchestrated by freelancers without any government encouragement. It would be really distressing to learn that our government was involved in any of this. Imagine the irony if government complicity were established by secret government documents someday to be leaked by WikiLeaks. So, questions about WikiLeaks, about these internet cases, or anything in the book, or whatever you want to talk about, I'll be here. Thank you. Um, I have a question for you about filters, a different sort of filter like top-level domain, XXX, or kids.com, which I think was in a concurrence or dissent of ACLU versus Reno. Uh, what do you think of them, or what would be the legal arguments against having those as part of government efforts to, uh, to censor the Internet? I, 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 the sound system sounds like you're, too, you're out in left field somewhere, <laughs> and I'm having trouble getting that. Yeah. But, but the filters and you said Yeah, just like using top-level domains like XXX or dot kids to establish like a sort of physical, the, the analog of physical zoning. Like, what do you think of it? How would you argue against it? Yeah, well, if, it, if the government requires it, that invites First Amendment litigation. If the government says you have to be over here, they're regulating the content of your speech. And that triggers the requirement that the government show a compelling interest in that restriction and that the restriction is narrowly tailored to serve that interest. I doubt serious, well, I don't think anybody is proposing that the government require um, that kind of zoning, uh, XXX, domain names, and so on. Um, I understand that the pornographers are on both sides of this. Uh, they want people to stumble into their sites accidentally. They don't want to be segregated, some of them. And some of them want to be liberated to put uh, whatever they want without people getting mad at them or getting interfered with by filters and so on. Um, that's a business choice. It's not a legal problem. Yeah. So on a personal level, do you believe that for, uh, First Amendment rights are an inalienable human right or just a cultural distinction that Americans have? <laughs> okay, so do you personally believe... Do you personally believe that First Amendment rights are a basic human right or a cultural right for Americans and other such democratic nations, like a cultural distinction? Uh, no, I, th I think uh, there's nearly universal agreement that free speech is a human right, and it's recognized by every constitution in the world that I've ever heard of. The Constitution of North Korea, Cuba, that are completely oppressive, recognize it, and all of the United Nations documents, the Declaration of Rights, and all of, all of the international treaties recognize free speech as a basic human right. Whether the countries live up to the lip service that they give to uh, these rights in their constitution is an entirely different matter.
not unique to the United States by any means. In fact, and this will be a little sobering to you, there are organizations that rank the countries of the world in terms of their free speech and press and so on. The United States, and the organization that I'm most familiar with is called Freedom House, started by Eleanor Roosevelt back just after World War II, and they rank all the countries in the world by how free they are every year. Their most recent report ranked the United States not first, not second, tied for 24th with the Czech Republic, behind countries like Estonia and Jamaica and so on, and ranked right up at the top in freedom of the press in particular, are all the Scandinavian countries. Iceland and, and Finland seem to trade off one and two year after year. It's all, all of them. Part of it has to do with the structure of our media. Part of it has to do with the decline of the newspaper industry here. In Finland, for example, a great majority of the population reads on paper two newspapers a day. Unheard of in this country. They just care more about those values than we seem to. Yes, sir. Uh, the state of Tennessee recently passed a bill the state of Tennessee recently passed a bill that uh, would fine a person who posts an image that's online that someone finds offensive. Uh, do you have any remarks about that, or do you think that bill is long for this world? I, I'm not familiar with the Tennessee bill. If all it does is say you can't post an image that is offensive, that is on its face unconstitutional, as I, as I say, Offensiveness is protected by the First Amendment. Many, many cases saying that the fact that something is offensive, is highly offensive, uh, doesn't deprive the speech of First Amendment protection. Um, and uh, that law would not survive scrutiny for more than a minute. Mm -hmm. Uh, you mentioned in uh, the Reno versus ACLU case that part of the ruling was based on Internet not sharing the unique properties of broadcast. Right. Uh, do you foresee kind of a return to that question now that Internet is increasingly accessed through potentially regulated spectrum? Potentially regulated spectrum such as? I mean, like, I mean, wire, like my cell phone oh. wireless connection. Um, no, I don't. I, I, I think... Uh, one of the benefits of having a totally corporate business oriented majority on the Supreme Court these days is that they are anti regulation. They all, the five conservatives on the court, all came to Washington uh, as part of the Reagan revolution. Let's get government off our backs. And one of the uh, items that the Reagan administration attacked right on was the fairness doctrine, which used to be imposed by the FCC on licensed broadcasters. They got rid of that. They abandoned that. Uh, and I don't detect any sentiment on the court for endorsing um, legislation now that would return the Internet to any kind of regulation about what it have what, what can be and what can't be done in the way of content. One slightly worrisome thing is the, the convergence factor, as, uh, as you mentioned, where um, the various media converge and become one. We get everything out of one place, a device or whatever it is. Um, that, that opens up the argument that there ought to be the government regulation of the FCC, for example. They still police indecency, you know. The, uh, CBS got fined uh, several hundred thousand dollars for showing a nanosecond of Janet Jackson's breast at the halftime show at the Super Bowl. The FCC is still in that business. They may be put out of it this year in a case that's pending in, in New York, but uh, the FCC is still policing the airwaves, which comes over the air, not cable. They don't police content on cable, but on over-the-air radio and television broadcast, the FC is still, still in that business. As media converge, would they likely extend that? I don't think so. I don't think they could get away with it. 
I got the impression that that you feel that the First Amendment should have protected WikiLeaks, and I was wondering, I don't, I don't know if that's true, but I was wondering if there are, is there any any type of government information that you think it should not protect uh, for divulging, for example, suitcase, atomic weapons, or whatever. Yeah, sure. No, obviously there, there are real, genuine needs for government to keep some secrets. Um, unfortunately, uh, government doesn't do a very good job on keeping secrets, uh, and they use that classified stamp um, in a libertine way. I mean, they just classify so much, the classification becomes meaningless. If private Bradley Manning, who's the alleged leaker to WikiLeaks, uh, was in fact the leaker, he had a security clearance that gave him access to all of those classified documents. He shared that clearance with 500,000 other people. How do you expect to keep a secret that 500,000 people have access to? You're right in thinking um, WikiLeaks ought to have, that I think WikiLeaks ought to have a First Amendment defense to violating the Espionage Act, but that depends on facts that I don't know. Wouldn't you like to hear the conversation between Assange and Manning? Because I think a lot depends on how WikiLeaks got the information. If they got the files over the transom, as we used to say, passively, they didn't do anything. They were just dumped in their lap and then published them on the Internet. That's just like the New York Times in the Pentagon Papers case. But if Assange and WikiLeaks actively solicited the leaks, paid the leaker, provided software assistance to the leaker and so on, then probably they can be charged with conspiracy, which is a prosecutor's favorite, um, and they're more like Ellsberg in that situation. They're the actual, they stand in the same shoes as the actual government employee who betrayed his trust. But we don't know what conversation, if any. I mean, Assange denies that there was any conversation. He denies knowing who Manning was until his name was published in the press later on. So good is uh, WikiLeaks encryption technology. Even the people at WikiLeaks don't know who they're dealing with. Well, on that okay. note, thank you very much for coming. Okay. Thank you. You guys are great.